Good morning. As I mentioned last week, <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, spend some time talking about the different estimation procedures, but the material that I'm going to present today uh, is not going to be on the final. Um, and then next time, I'm going to do uh, basically a review, uh, maybe just talk about a couple of new things. But um, And then next week, it will be uh, the midterm. Okay, so what I want to start with today is uh, uh, linear models. Okay, so generally what we're talking about here is, uh, this is so blurry. Um, generally what we're talking about is a model um, where the data is some vector x and the parameters of interest <coughs> are theta plus noise. So this here is a matrix times a vector. Um, this theta here is the unknown. And this H is sometimes called the system matrix or the measurement matrix. Uh, so system or measurement matrix. Okay. And uh, for the time being, what we're going to assume, well, this is noise. And we're going to study the case where this noise here is uh, Gaussian um, and uncorrelated. So let me give you an example of what this might look like. So suppose I give you a bunch of samples, let's say n equals 0 to uh, n minus 1, and um, your model is the following. Say x of n is equal to uh, a, some constant a, plus b times n plus c times n squared plus noise. Okay? And these are unknown. So this, at first, uh, it looks like you know not a linear model because you've got quadratics and n and so on and so forth. But the point is, this is linear in the unknowns. Okay, that's what's really important here. Um, so in other words, I could write this x of n as um, you know one n n squared times A, B, C plus noise, right? I mean, this is exactly the same thing here. Now I have N of these measurements, capital N measurements. And what I'm going to do is stack them all down uh, to get a formula that looks like that. So how does that look? Um, so I write X of 0, X of 1 of n minus 1, 
this is equal to a matrix times A, B, C plus the vector of minus W0 to W n minus 1. Okay, and what goes in here is basically this. Each row is going to look like that for different values of n. So the first row would be 1, 0, 0. The next row would be 1, 1, 1, and so on. And the last row would be 1, uh, n minus 1, n minus 1 squared. Okay? So then this can be written in this form, where this is h. This is theta, and this is w and x. Okay? So it's a linear estimation problem because the parameters appear in linear fashion. This being a linear equation. Okay, so how do we estimate these parameters for the given data? This type of problem is very, very common in all kinds of engineering applications. Uh, and in fact, if the problem is, even if the problem is not linear in the parameters, it's oftentimes possible and desirable to linearize the problem. Okay, so you can use something like a Taylor series expansion to linearize it, the problem and then estimate these parameters. Um, and the value of that estimate, of course, is going to be reasonable only for a limited range of values. Okay, but let's stick with this general model for now. So let's take this uh, general formulation again, H theta plus W. And let's consider the case where W is Gaussian with zero mean and covariance sigma squared times identity. So what that means is that each element of W is uncorrelated and Gaussian. Okay, so um, in order to estimate this, <coughs> one thing we can do, <coughs> excuse me, is to uh, look at the uh, conditional probability density for x given theta, and this of course will be a multidimensional Gaussian, 1 over 2 pi sigma squared to the n over 2, and then an exponential minus 1 over 2 sigma squared, x minus h theta, transpose x minus h theta. Okay, this is simple because this 1 over 2 sigma squared just comes from inverting this covariance matrix. Okay, now um, given this, I, I'd like to see if there's a, um, a minimum variance unbiased estimator. And if you remember, the, the way we looked at the minimum variance unbiased estimator was to see if we could take uh, the log likelihood function, which was the log of this, take the derivative of it, and see if we can write it in a particular form, right? So let's carry that through. So uh, if I look at d by d theta the log of p, this is d by d theta, and then let me write the log minus n over 2 log of 2 pi sigma squared minus 1 over 2 sigma squared x minus h theta transpose x minus h theta. Okay? Now this part here, this part um, actually does not depend on the data and it doesn't depend on the parameter either. Right? So this really doesn't do anything. And of course, once you take the derivative of it, it goes away. All right, so uh, what we have is this part just goes away. Then you get minus 1 over uh, 2 sigma squared d by d theta of this guy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the terms of this quadratic out so we can see what they look like. x transpose x minus 2 x transpose h theta plus theta transpose h transpose h theta. Okay? And if you differentiate this, this first term doesn't involve theta, so that goes away. Um, the second term is linear in theta, so you're going to get h transpose x. And the second term is quadratic in theta, so you're going to get 2 h transpose h theta. So this becomes, uh, simplify some of the signs, you get 1 over sigma squared uh, times h transpose x minus h transpose h theta. Uh, and simplify one more step. Uh, if you extract this h transpose h uh, by inverting it and pulling it out, you get 1 over sigma squared h transpose h 
And then here you have H transpose H inverse H transpose X minus theta. Okay? Now guess what happened? Uh, we wrote this derivative as exactly as a G of X minus theta. And this is in fact the I of theta. Okay? So this is the formulation that we were kind of looking for. <coughs> so what this means is because we're able to write it this way, then the minimum variance on biased estimator for theta, in fact, exists in this case. And not only does it exist, its formula is given by this. It's H transpose H inverse H transpose X. Okay. So this may be familiar to you from other contexts. This is, in fact, what is known as the least square solution. Okay. Now, we derived it here from a completely different point of view. right? We just wrote down this Gaussian, the linear model, Gaussian noise, and we got the least square solution. Now, you could have done this a little differently, and we will do this a little later in the course. We could have just started with the least squares criterion. We could have just said, you know, forget about the densities. I don't care what the noise distribution is. All I'm going to do is I will start with something that looks like this, and I'll say I want to minimize this quadratic as a function of theta. Okay? If you'd done that, then you would have gotten exactly the same thing, and you would have just called it the least squares solution. Except that what we've done here is we've made various other assumptions, so now we can also call it minimum variance on bias estimate. So the bottom line, and I, I will summarize this a, a little later, but the bottom line is that minimum variance on biased estimator for the linear model with Gaussian assumptions is the same thing as the least square solution. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now I, what I'd like to do is to look at this expression and study it a little bit more closely and see what kind of properties we can get, uh, we can get out of it. Okay, so uh, let me rewrite this. Theta hat H transpose H inverse H transpose X. Okay, first of all, um, let's take a look at the statistical properties of this estimate and uh, convince ourselves that in fact it is uh, uh, unbiased and, and, and so on. So expected value of theta hat is H transpose H inverse H transpose expected value of X. So this is H transpose H inverse H transpose H theta, which is theta. So it's unbiased. Okay. I mean, we, we're just uh, kind of going through the long way showing that it's, it's minimum variance unbiased estimate. Okay, and then covariance of theta hat. <coughs> This is the inverse of the Fisher information matrix because it's a minimum variance on bias estimator. So this is going to be uh, sigma squared times H transpose H inverse. If you remember, this I of theta is just this guy. Okay. All right, so what does that mean? Uh, theta hat is a linear function of the data. The data was Gaussian, so theta hat is also a Gaussian random variable. Therefore, uh, with this mean and this covariance, so what I can write is theta hat is, in fact, the Gaussian random variable with the correct mean, the actual value of the solution, the actual value of the parameter, sigma squared H transpose H inverse. Okay? Okay, now, once you write this down, uh, <coughs> what you'll notice is of course, the uncertainty in this value, if you think of it as a random variable, is directly related to this term, right? So if you think of theta hat as a random variable, this tells you the variance of that random variable, tells you the covariance of the random variable. So what you notice is that somehow, if H transpose H inverse is badly behaved, in other words, if, it's close, if H transpose H is close to singular, you can get uh, some problematic uh, answers. Uh, in fact, this is uh, uh, a, a little easier to see in, if, you, if you write your solution like this. So let me um, rewrite uh, the x. It's 
So theta hat is h transpose h inverse h transpose. And now let me re re uh, rewrite x in terms of the measurement model. Remember the measurement model was h theta plus w, right? So if we write this, we multiply it through, and h transpose h inverse h transpose h theta plus h transpose h inverse h transpose w, right? So this is just theta plus h transpose h inverse h transpose w. Okay, so this is your estimate. This part is perfect, right? This part just involves the noise and this uh, matrix here. So in other words, if this matrix is close to singular, think of h transpose h as being a number close to zero. If you invert it, this term is going to blow up, right? So this term is going to take whatever little amount of noise you have, and it's going to explode it, OK? So this is uh, noise magnification. Okay, we can uh, characterize this noise magnification using uh, the singular value decomposition a little bit more uh, formally. So invertibility of H transpose H, we measure this using the uh, singular value decomposition, or, or I should say, um, the lack of invertibility of H transposition, or how close it is to being not invertible, we can measure with the singular value decomposition. So remember, H uh, is a matrix that's most likely ha uh, got a shape like this, right? It's got a shape like this because this P, this is the number of parameters, and this is N, which is the number of uh, measurements. Okay, so we're assuming that they have more measurements than you have parameters. You can also do the case where you have fewer parameters, uh, so, sorry, fewer measurements than parameters, but then you have to make some other assumptions. But for now, we're going to assume that H has a shape like this. So if you write the singular value decomposition for H, you're going to write something like U, S, V transpose. And in fact, the matrix S is going to be the same shape as H. It's going to have some singular values S1 through SP, and these are diagonal, and then all zeros here, okay? So the S1, uh, S2, and so on, these are all uh, arranged in decreasing fashion, and they're all positive by definition. So the condition number, right, the condition number of H is the ratio of the largest to the smallest singular value, okay? So for instance, if all of these numbers were one, then this condition number would be one, which would be perfect, right? On the other hand, if the, let's say, to take the smallest condition number. If the smallest condition number was close to zero, then this would be some number divided by something very close to zero, so the condition number would blow up, and that would be bad, okay? So condition number going to infinity uh, would be close to singular. Okay? And then if the condition number goes towards one, that is uh, sort of the perfect, perfectly conditioned matrix. Like the identity matrix is perfectly conditioned. Okay? All right, now let's take a look at H transpose H. <coughs> What's the condition number of H transpose H? So this is uh, H transpose H is, uh, you basically write USV transpose, transpose USV transpose. Okay, and simplify this, you get uh, V S transpose U transpose US V transpose. This is identity. This is V, S transpose S, V transpose. And S transpose S is a square matrix.
with the diagonals the square of the singular values and the off diagonals is zero. So remember S is the same size as H, which is uh, N by P. So S transpose S is P by P, which is exactly what I've drawn here. Okay? So the condition number of H, going back to this, is then the ratio of the singular values of H transpose H, which are the square of the singular values that we had before. So this is S1 squared divided by SP squared. Okay. So in fact, this is the square of the condition number of H. So if the condition number of H is bad, the condition number of H transpose H is even worse. Okay. So one has to be very careful how you set up the estimation problem. And oftentimes, this model is something that you may not have any control over. It is what it is. And so if you have a situation like this, then you have to be making other assumptions about the data so as to regularize the problem, so make the problem more stable, numerically stable. Sometimes you have some control over this H. And let me give you an example of when you have some control. So in fact, we can do this in a little bit more sophisticated setting. So suppose I have um, the following curve fitting problem. So suppose I have uh, a bunch of data on the plane. Uh, say this is the x-axis, and I have a bunch of data at points, uh, you know, x1, x2, uh, and so on. Let's say x0, x1, and so on, up to xn minus 1. And let's say these points are you know, kind of continuing on like that. Okay? And what I would like to do is to fit some curve through these in a way that you know, captures all of this data. Now, these this x's that I put here, they're not meant to be right on the, the red curve. These are just a bunch of noisy data points, and I'm going to fit some curve to it. So the, the model that I'm going to pick for this red curve is I'm going to say, let's say, f of x is equal to uh, some exponential model. So let's say it's uh, some constant a times um, x to the beta. Okay. So some amplitude and then some uh, exponential function here. Now the data that I've captured, the, da the, the data that I've modeled, is uh, y n is equal to a x n to the beta plus uh, noise. Okay, that's those are these x's. Okay. So again, this may not uh, or doesn't look like uh, a Gaussian model. I'm sorry, it doesn't look like a linear model. This certainly doesn't look linear in a or in beta. But if you're willing to play around with this equation, you may in fact be able to make it into a linear model with a slightly different definition of noise. <coughs> so imagine we do the following. We define Zn uh, to be the log of Yn. Okay. Then um, what we can do is to approximately write, rewrite this model as uh, Zn is log of a plus beta times log of xn plus some other error. Okay. Now you have two parameters. Call this theta one and call this theta two. And now they appear in a linear fashion in this uh, in this formulation. Now your error here may not be exactly Gaussian. I mean, you might have started off with Gaussian noise here, but then if you do this, then this is no longer Gaussian noise. Right? But whether it's Gaussian or not, you can always set up this least squares problem that we just showed you. Okay. So let's take a look at what happens if we just start with this uh, linear model and push it forward. And what I want to illustrate to you is how the condition number for this problem depends on these positions where the data are taken. Okay. Turns out this is a major uh, source of error uh, in, in this type of fitting problem. So now let's uh, collect all of our data, so z0, z1, zn minus 1. So 
Okay, and here we're going to have uh, 1 log of x0, 1 log of x1, 1 log x n minus 1, and then you've got two parameters of theta 1 and theta 2, plus noise. Okay? <clears throat> so again, this is your h, this is your theta. So your theta hat is h transpose h inverse h transpose z. Okay? Now let's take a look at what happens with, uh, with these data points. So I showed you an example where the data are collected, uh, you know, kind of like this. Okay, and you, you do this problem, you come up with these two coefficients, you fit something to it. And it's not a perfect fit, but it's okay. All right? Now suppose that instead of these data points being collected at these positions, suppose they're collected in the following position. Now your data look like this. Okay? Now what's going to happen is you're going to make a fit to this, and that fit's going to be pretty good here. But maybe out here, it's going to be completely wrong for any other data you might have collected here. Why? Because let's take this to its sort of logical limit. Suppose you know this might look like that. If you take it to its logical limit, suppose all of these data were collected in a in a neighborhood that is only epsilon wide, right? Almost right on top of each other. Then if you do a fit to that, what's going to happen to this curve? With a small amount of noise, this curve is just going to completely look different, right? Whereas when your data is nicely spread out here, even if the noise is uh, increased, the shape of this curve is going to be pretty stable. Okay? Whereas here, you can have very wild oscillations in, in the way this curve behaves. This is directly related to the condition number of this matrix. And you can see that by simply looking at these two columns, right? Look at the first column, it's all ones, right? If all the x's are really close to each other, what does the second column look like? It's going to look like the same number along the second column as well. So the two columns will then become very close to being linear combinations of one another. I mean, one is just going to be a factor times the other, right? And that is related to the rank of this matrix basically dropping. If you have the two columns, if one is just simply a, uh, a linear multiple of the other, then the rank is going to be one, which means that H transpose H is not even invertible, okay? All right. So it's always good to keep in mind that the, uh, the intuition behind these condition numbers and um, how they affect the overall accuracy of the problem. Okay, so uh, the, the situation that we just described, we can also make it more general. We can say, uh, you know, suppose the noise is, uh, this W is Gaussian with zero mean, and now let's say it's got some general covariance matrix C. <coughs> Before we just dealt with the case where this was sigma squared times identity. Now let's take a look at the general case. Okay, so we play the same trick that we did before, uh, namely we use uh, um, the decomposition of C. So we write uh, C inverse as a D transpose D, and if you remember, this is what I called the, uh, the matrix square root. Okay. And because C is uh, symmetric positive definite, this matrix square root is well defined. However, let me warn you, by the way, this matrix square root is not unique because if I stick in the middle here an orthogonal matrix, then it cancels out. Right? So instead of D, I write uh, Q times D. Then this becomes D transpose Q transpose QD. And if Q transpose Q is identity because it's an orthogonal matrix, then you get exactly the same thing. All right, so we write this out, and then we use the matrix D 
to uh, change this equation to the standard form that we've already studied. So we multiply both sides of this equation by d, and we get dx equals dh theta plus dw. And you can just redefine this as x prime. You redefine this as h prime times theta, and you redefine this as w prime. So this becomes x prime equals h prime theta plus w prime. And now, the nice thing about it is that w prime is now um, a standardized uh, random variable. In other words, it has a covariance matrix, which is identity. And that's easy to see. If you like covariance of w prime, this is d times covariance of w times d transpose, which is d c d transpose, which is d d transpose d inverse d transpose, which is identity. Okay. So this is basically the same problem that we've been dealing with before, except even the sigma squared has been normalized out, and uh, uh, you simply have identity left. So based on this, the solution to this, the minimum variance unbiased estimator for this problem, <coughs> theta hat is h prime transpose h prime inverse h prime transpose x prime. Okay. where h prime is defined this way and so on. And if you just plug in what h prime is, which is, is d times h, what you get is this is h prime d transpose d h inverse h prime d transpose d x. Um, and then let's rewrite what d transpose d is. Again, it's c inverse, so theta hat is h transpose c inverse h inverse h transpose c inverse x. Okay, so this is it, very much the same solution as we had before, except that there's a c inverse stuck in between here. Okay, of course, the c inverse before was 1 over sigma squared times identity, so that sigma just came out. Okay, so the general scenario here is uh, you can make this even more general. In other words, what if the noise was not uh, zero mean? So you could write you know, x is h theta plus w, where w is Gaussian with uh, mean s and covariance c. Okay, uh, that's very much like this. Uh, the, I, I'm going to skip through the derivation, but what happens is theta hat is h transpose c inverse h inverse h transpose c inverse. Now instead of x, you simply do x minus s. Okay? And that's because this s can simply be written here as another constant, which you presumably know. You subtract that s from both sides, and then you just get the standard formula, uh, which is this. Okay, so this is the uh, general minimum variance unbiased estimator for this Gaussian linear estimation problem. If you're also interested in not just theta, but some linear function of theta, in other words, let's say you're, est you're interested in some A times theta. Let's say you're interested in alpha equals a times theta. What is the minimum variance on bias estimator for alpha? It's just this. Okay, because if you remember, I, I showed you that linear operations preserve efficiency. Right? So this is an efficient estimator in this case. And so if you just want the linear function of that efficient estimator, you just multiply, just plug it in. Okay? Okay, any questions about this? All right, so the next thing I, I would like to do is talk about maximum likelihood estimation, which is a much more general uh, framework uh, for estimating parameters.
And uh, by the way, if, uh, in case you're wondering, this is chapter seven of the estimation book. Okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, when do you plan on posting the lecture notes? I'm sorry? When do you plan on posting the lecture notes? Well, the lecture notes are already there, so the only thing I may not have done is give you the, forbi the, the, yeah. the permission for it. Okay, I mean, so. For the last two weeks, they've, all been, they've been forbidden, so. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I will make sure that doesn't happen again. So I will put them all, I'll change the permission on all of them once and for all. Okay. Yeah, done. Okay. So those, those lecture notes are actually not the live notes that I'm writing here. They're from previous years, so I can do that easily. Okay. Sorry about that. OK. <coughs> OK, so um, the idea is, for maximum likelihood, what we're going to do is to look at um, this likelihood function, which is the joint density of uh, the data given a, a particular parameter. And what we're going to do is look at how this quantity is in fact changing as a function of theta. Okay, so, so far we've kind of looked at this as uh, how does it change as a function of x, but we can also think of it as a function of theta. And that allows us to define this, uh, uh, this thing called the maximum likelihood estimate. So let's take the very simple case, and I've kind of given you a, a little bit of a preview to this uh, in the earlier lectures. Let's take the case where you have a single measurement, okay? So suppose, just as a way of motivating it, motivating it suppose you have um, a single measurement x, okay? And uh, with two possible uh, parameters, theta 1 and theta 2. In other words, the problem is that you make a measurement theta, that make measurement somehow depends on a parameter theta, which can take on two different values. Okay. Now you ask the question, what would be the probability, what is the probability that you would measure the particular x that you saw if the underlying parameter was theta 1, or if the underlying parameter was theta 0? You might remember I, I did this example for you where I drew two different Gaussians, okay? One of them with mean theta 1, one of them with mean theta 2. And then I drew the data point. And if it fell really close to the peak of one of these Gaussians, then you would pick that one, right? So I think the picture was something like this. Right, so this is theta 1, this is theta 2, and now let's say your x, your data point, uh, somehow falls uh, in this region, okay? So which one of these is the more likely value of theta? Well, that one, right? So the idea here is, depending on which theta you choose, you are more or less likely to have seen x, right? Okay, so this is the, the intellectually sort of, this is the, the, uh, the cornerstone of this whole thing. So let's be a little bit more specific about what we mean. Uh, let's ask, what is the probability that we would measure A particular x um, if let's say theta is equal to theta 1 okay okay so the way we're going to do this is we'll draw uh, the probability density function this is PDF of x given theta 1, okay? And um, let's give this uh, data point uh, uh, 
a subscript so that we can distinguish it from the generic x. So let's say this is x1. Okay. What would be the probability that you measure a particular x1 if theta is equal to theta1? So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go into this picture and we're going to draw uh, what x1 is. Okay. And we're going to look at a very small window around this x1. And we're going to look at this area under the curve. And what is this area under the curve? This is the probability that x is within that small window around x1. Okay? So this is this is the probability that x is between x1 minus, let's say, dx over 2 and uh, x1 plus dx over 2. And this dx is just a differential. Uh, it's like an epsilon to the left and right of that actual value. So what this is measuring is the likelihood that this particular data point would be measured within this interval. Okay? All right, so let's rewrite this in a little bit different way. Um, okay, so this probability, probability that x is between x1 minus dx over 2 and x2, uh, sorry, x1 plus dx over 2, this probability is approximately equal to the PDF of x evaluated at x1 conditioned on theta1 times dx. Why? Because this area here, this little area is dx, and the area under this is approximately equal to uh, this width times this height, where this value here is this guy. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So then we make the same argument uh, for the other parameter. We ask, what is the probability that you would have measured x in this particular small interval if the other parameter uh, was the true parameter, if theta 2 was the true parameter. Okay, what would that be? Well, that one would be PDF x equals x1 given theta 2 times dx. Right? Same argument. And now how are you going to choose which one of these is the right one? Well, you compare them. Right? So whichever one is bigger wins. Okay, so you compare these, and um, basically what happens is theta hat, then the estimate becomes uh, the value uh, of i that maximizes this PDF of x given x1 given theta i. Sorry, equal to x equals x1. Okay? So you look at, uh, you, you might have not just one theta, but you might have a whole collection of thetas that could possibly have been the right parameter value. Yeah? So how is this different from a minimum distance detector? This is has nothing to do with minimum distance detector. I mean, Maybe you can explain to me why you think they're similar. Uh, we're testing, uh, again, Sage theta is a hypothesis. We're testing which is the most which is the most likely. Right, right. So let, okay. So let me rephrase your question. This is not. I, I don't want to confuse it with a minimum distance detector. But what you've pointed out correctly is that we are treating the estimation problem as a kind of detection problem mm -hmm. because we're at the end kind of comparing two probability densities, right? Right. So in that sense, what we've done is we have. Um, Use our intuition from before, from the detection criterion, from the detection criteria to solve an estimation problem. Now, the difficulty with taking that intuition too far is that the value, and this is what I was about to say next, is that the values of theta that you are usually looking at are not a discrete and countable number of parameters. So, typically, the value of theta that you don't know. Ranges over a continuum of values. It can be anything from zero to infinity. Then, in that case, you would, you're going to have an infinite number of hypotheses, right? So the analogy kind of breaks down. Okay. But it's a good place to kind of 
make that break and, and think about the continuous case now. So what happens in this situation now is that I can think if I have a continuous range of thetas, I can now look at a plot of this PDF of x for the particular data point that I have, given theta, where this theta ranges over, let's say, 0 to infinity. And what is it going to look like? So let's see, this is theta now. And I plot this, and maybe it looks uh, you know, something like this. Okay? And I look at the maximum of this curve. This is not necessarily the same as the curves that you had before. So this theta star, or theta hat, uh, is going to be the maximum of this quantity. Maximum of this as a function of theta. So the value of theta that yields the peak on this curve is, in fact, the maximum likelihood estimate. So theta hat is the argument that maximizes the PDF of x given theta over all theta. Okay. And I'm not going to keep writing x equals x1 and so on and so forth. This is just the general description that we're going to use. <coughs> OK. So just to uh, summarize, I'll write this again, so don't worry. Generally, you're given a bunch of data points, say x1 through xn. Okay. From these, you compute uh, the joint probability density function, which is p of x uh, given theta, for this data. Then, the maximum likelihood estimate is the argument that maximizes over theta the PDF that you just calculated. Uh, another way to think about it, a completely equivalent, is the argument that maximizes over theta the log of this joint PDF. The log is a monotonic function, so it's not going to change the location of the peak that you would be finding. Oftentimes, because these probability density functions look like e to the something, it's easier to deal with the log. And so this is the log likelihood function. All right, so how do we do this? How do we solve this optimization problem? Well, n it's not very hard. You just take a derivative of this guy and set it equal to zero and get the right value of theta. So despite what may have been a little bit uh, um, confusing in terms of the definition of the maximum likelihood and where it comes from, the actual calculation is very simple and quite mechanical. So the way you do it is you just take the derivative with respect to theta, of the log of this likelihood function, you set it equal to zero, and you solve, and this gives you the maximum likelihood uh, estimate for theta. Um, but you also have to make sure that this derivative is, in fact, giving you the maximum. So just to be 100% sure, what you have to do is also compute the second derivative evaluated at this particular value theta equals theta hat maximum likelihood and make sure that it's negative okay just to make sure that you're getting the, the uh, maximum and not the an inflection point or a minimum okay so this equation this is called the maximum likelihood equation and it provides uh, basically a way of turning the crank and getting an answer so let's do a couple of examples Okay, so the easiest example to do is one that we've done a thousand times so far. So this is a plus some constant, uh, less than, so, some noise, some constant plus noise. And uh, w is normal, zero mean, variance sigma squared, iid. Okay? So um, you have n data points. Uh, the joint density for this is going to be a multidimensional Gaussian with n variables. You take the log of the uh, li likelihood function with respect to A, you take the derivative of it, you get 1 over sigma squared 
sum x of n minus a equals 1 to n equals 0. Okay, we solve this. You get 1 over n, sum of x of n equals 1 to n. So the, the same estimate as we got for the minimum variance unbiased estimator, the same estimate that we got for the least squares estimator, and so on. So it happens to be the maximum likelihood estimate in this case as well. Um, here's a, a, a less trivial example. X of n, say a plus w of n. Now let's say w is normal with zero mean and variance also a. Okay, so the mean is a and the variance is a. Now you're asked to estimate A. Let's see how that works. In this case, the joint probability density for n data points is 1 over 2 pi A to the n over 2. I can no longer ignore this because it, in fact, contains the unknown variable. Exponential minus 1 over 2A sum n equals 1 to n x of n minus a squared. Okay? So then um, I take the log of this, uh, differentiate it, set it equal to 0. It's minus n over 2a plus 1 over a sum. 1 to n, x of n minus a, plus 2a squared, so minus 1, x of n minus a squared. Okay. Okay. So then we solve for this whole thing, um, and what we get is a hat, uh, or a squared plus a minus 1 over n uh, summation of x squared n equals 0. And you solve this as a quadratic equation. What you get is a hat maximum likelihood. You get minus 1 half. And then it's a quadratic, so it's going to have two solutions, plus or minus square root of 1 over n times the sum of x of n squared plus a quarter. OK, now here you have to be a little careful. Uh, one of these solutions is not valid, OK? Because if you remember, we said that a was also a variance. So a is the mean and a is the variance. So the negative can't be. And in fact, if you wanted to do this more carefully, you could take the second derivative and make sure that you get the maximum. Okay? And so one of these wouldn't give you the maximum. So this guy here, uh, you get rid of. Okay, and of course, you can see here that the answer is going to be valid because this, the answer is this square root minus a half. So it's always going to be bigger than zero because here, there's a, uh, there's a quarter, the square root of which would be this one half. Okay? So it's always a valid answer. Okay, so um, the maximum likelihood estimator is very, very useful because it has some very nice properties, uh, which I, uh, I'd like to um, emphasize here. So this ML estimator. Here's some properties. The first one, I'm not going to prove this. Uh, if an efficient estimator exists, it is maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, this is a really 
interesting and powerful result. Question. Yeah. Uh, the last example, uh, the point was a local minimizer, not a maximizer. Uh, which, which, which one are you talking about? You're talking about this example? Yes. This one. Okay. This is local the, what? This is the minimum of that quadratic curve. The, the one with the plus? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. It's the minimum of the quadratic curve, but it's the maximum of the exponential. So you're right, but I'm also right. Yes. <laughs> because what happens here is that if you look at this, if you maximize this whole thing, what you're doing is you're minimizing what's in the exponent. So you're right. Okay. That's kind of the difference between doing this and doing least squares. In least squares, you have a quadratic, and you minimize it. Here, you have a PDF and you maximize it. But usually because of that e to the minus, one and the same. They're one and the same. Okay, okay so going back to this. Uh, this is a nice result because it says if you have an efficient estimator, and let me remind you what an efficient estimator is, is one that achieves this uh, lower bound, the kramer rao lower bound, right? If such an estimator exists, then it is the maximum likelihood estimator. Now, it's not telling you the reverse. Right? So you have to be very careful about this. It is not telling you that the maximum likelihood estimator is always efficient. What it's saying is that if an efficient estimator exists, then it is the maximum likelihood estimator. Okay. So uh, given that you don't have a perfect direction, uh, it's sort of perfect implication both ways, what this only shows you is that maximum likelihood estimator is a good bet Right? Should always the first thing you should do when somebody asks you to estimate a parameter is set up the maximum likelihood estimator. Why? Because it's easy to calculate. And two, you might get lucky and you might in fact get the efficient estimator. Not necessarily, but you might. Because if an efficient estimator exists, then it's what you just calculate. Okay. All right, the second uh, reason why uh, this is a good thing to do, this maximum likelihood is a good thing to do, is that asymptotically, the ML estimator is, in fact, efficient. And by asymptotically, we mean, you know, when the number of data points goes to infinity. So, the reverse implication of taking the maximum likelihood estimator and asking, oh, is it efficient? It's true if you have a huge number of data points. Okay? So, generally, it's very hard to do better than the maximum likelihood estimator if you don't have any other information. Okay? And, of course, it's very easy. And finally, um, of course, it's the ML is uh, is easy to compute and is generally intuitive. Now, what I mean by intuitive is that if you uh, if you took the case, for example, the example where there was a constant that was unknown plus noise plus Gaussian noise. And I just ask you, give me your best intuitive answer as to what a good estimate for A would be. What would you do? You would average. Right? It turns out, oftentimes, if you just look at the form of the maximum likelihood estimate that you get, it's what you would have guessed. Okay? So it often conforms to your intuition. It's not a theorem I'm giving you, it's just an observation. Okay. So there is a more general um, theorem that describes these properties. And uh, so I want to give you this. Um, so what you have is you're given a probability density function like this, which is the joint density for all the data. Um, if the derivatives, uh, this and the second order derivative, are well defined. 
well-defined meaning they're not blowing up at any given point. Um, and this regularity condition is satisfied, namely this expected value um, of the score function is equal to zero. Then, uh, in fact, the maximum likelihood estimate for theta asymptotically, and we write this as a tilde with an A on top of it, uh, the distribution of this guy is in fact Gaussian with the Fisher information inverse as the covariance. Okay, so this requires a little bit of uh, digestion, let's say. First of all, uh, let me go back and remind you that this maximum likelihood equation, what you're doing here is you're looking at the score function, right? So think of this as the score function. So what this says is that if this standard condition with the expected value of the score function is zero and these two conditions are satisfied where the, these, are, these exist, then regardless of what this distribution is, so P doesn't have to be a Gaussian, it can be anything, anything well behaved. Then asymptotically when you have a lot of data points, the distribution of theta gives you a Gaussian which has the correct value, which means that it's asymptotically unbiased. And the variance of this guy achieves the lower bound given by the Cramerau bound, which means that it's efficient. Okay? So we said that here. We said asymptotically, the maximum likelihood estimate is efficient. So this says that, but it says more. In other words, not only is it efficient, but as a random variable, it has a Gaussian distribution. I mean, this is a remarkable fact, okay? Now, why is it Gaussian? Well, it turns out the argument for why it's Gaussian is basically some generalized version of the central limit theory, okay? Because what are you doing with the data? When you have a whole bunch of data, you're combining this data and you're somehow adding them and subtracting them and doing various numerical operations to them and you have these very general forms of the uh, central limit theorem and this is if you take a bunch of data and you massage it a lot together what you end up with at the end is a Gaussian distribution and that's what this is telling. Okay. So this is a really tremendously useful result to know because it gives you a lot of confidence in working with the maximum likelihood estimate. Okay, especially in the large data scenario. Okay, so is this clear? Any questions? All right, so one might ask, well, how do we uh, sort of verify something like this? If I wanted to go into my uh, office and turn on my computer and, and play with something like this to see this behavior, how would I do it? Well, uh, let me give you kind of an outline of how you would simulate something like this. <coughs> is what you would do is, uh, this is sort of an outline of a simulation. I think we have something like this in the homework, and I would say you should play with this. And, and any of the research problems that I know you two guys work on will, you know, involves things like this. So what you're going to do is you're going to generate some data, x, okay, um, for some underlying value of the parameter. Let's say theta is equal to theta zero, okay. And you might have some model for generating this. Or it might be that there's a black box that you give it theta and it spits out a bunch of data. Okay? And you're trying to understand how to estimate these parameters. Okay, so then what you do is you estimate theta hat using your function of the data. This might be the maximum likelihood estimate, for example. And then you repeat this process which means you go back and you generate some new data, always keeping the distribution fixed though. Right? It's the same, distri same noise distribution, but different realizations of the noise. So for instance, in MATLAB, if you say rand of something, it will give you a random vector. Now if you say rand again, it will give you another random vector. It won't give you exactly the same numbers, but it will give you numbers from the same distribution. Rand will give you uniform distribution. Rand n will give you Gaussian distribution. Okay, so you repeat this, and what do you get? 
But when you repeat it, you get, uh, let's say you repeat this m times. You get theta 1 hat, uh, theta 2 hat, so on, theta m hat. Okay? Each time, the density is the same, but the data is different. So you get these values. Then what do you do with these values? You uh, make a plot. This is theta. And you break this plot, uh, you break this axis into uh, a bunch of bins. Okay? And then you look at these and you count how many of these fall into, let's say, this bin. Okay, so let's say you do this a thousand times. And then you look through these, say, how many of these fall into this bin? And let's say 50 of them do. You make a line with the height 50. Okay? You go to the next bin. How many of these fell into this bin? into this range of value, well, maybe that one, and so on. And maybe it looks something like this. Okay. And what you have here is a histogram, which is a very basic empirical estimate of the probability density function for theta hat. Okay. So this basically gives you a, an empirical estimate for the, the density that uh, you would expect to have. And so what we said before is that if your data satisfies these, uh, uh, these regularity conditions and uh, you use the maximum likelihood estimator, then with enough data, with enough x, this curve will look like a Gaussian. What does it mean uh, these two uh, are well defined? These? In the last stage. This. Oh, it simply means that basically at, at no value of theta will these blow up to infinity. That's it. Okay, so you can, it, it simply means that the log of p is twice differential. Okay, it's called C2. Okay. Okay, so let's do a, a, a little bit more involved example of uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so the problem is the following. Um, you have two vectors, two types of vectors. Let me define these. Uh, v of some angle phi. This is cosine phi, sine phi, and then u of theta, just cosine theta, sine theta. So what these are, these two u and v are unit vectors, okay? And let's say for um, uh, n equals uh, 1 to capital N, what you're measuring yn is equal to u transpose theta n times v, uh, uh, yeah, well, u transpose, I don't need this, v of phi plus error. Okay, what am I talking about here? Th this is the inner product of these two vectors. So in other words, what you're measuring is the inner product between these two vectors. And what you would like to do is to find out what the angle of this other vector was. Okay, this has applications in various areas, uh, like in radar. This has some applications in tomography, uh, in medical imaging. It has some applications. Generally, you get this kind of measurement equation where what you're trying to reconstruct or what you're trying to estimate is a vector field. Okay, this is a very simple example of that. Well, all you're trying to do is estimate a single vector. And vector fields are fairly common things that you would want to estimate. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the flow of blood in, uh, in the human body uh, is measured um, in various ways. One of them is using ultrasound. Okay, so when you're measuring that, you're looking at the flow, and the flow is a vector, which is a magnitude and a phase. Okay, now often you can't measure the vector directly, so what you're doing is you're sensing the vector by hitting it with another vector. 
And that's what this is doing. You're computing an inner product between the two vectors. What you measure is the angle, basically. And then you try to you get this V. Uh, and you can hit this V with various different angles. Okay, so here what we have done is use N of these. So let's see what these equations look like, what the measurements look like. So Yn is uh, cosine B cosine theta N plus sine V uh, sine theta N plus the error. Okay? And I'm going to assume that these, uh, th this error here is Gaussian zero mean sigma squared. Okay? <coughs> so as you can see here, this clearly is not, <coughs> is not necessarily a linear problem for the unknown angle phi. Okay? And what we're going to do is uh, write down this uh, joint PDF for all the data given phi. B is the unknown. So 1 over 2 pi sigma squared n over 2 exponential minus 1 over 2 sigma squared sum n equals 1 n y n minus cosine of v minus theta n squared. Okay, this is simply the cosine of v minus theta n. So I'm just using the difference, cosine difference formula. Okay? Alright, so then well, what we do is try to find the maximum likelihood estimate. So uh, we compute this uh, and uh, you know, set it equal to zero. As we discussed a little bit earlier, because this exponential with a minus sign is there, this is equivalent, minimizing this using this equation, uh, sorry, maximizing the likelihood using this equation is equivalent to minimizing the thing that's in the numerator, the thing that's in the exponent. So this is exactly equivalent to uh, minimizing over phi with the sum, n equals 1 to n of y n minus cosine phi minus theta n squared. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so then let's just work with this guy and uh, I'm going to call this J of B. This is a cost function that we're going to minimize. So DJ D phi is equal to zero is two sum yn minus cosine v minus theta n times sine v minus theta n. Okay, you set this equal to zero. And now we have to solve. Um, so we get sine, so, sorry, sum yn um, Sine. Okay, so we have two terms here, right? You have sum of yn times this sine and then the cosine times this sine. And I'm going to write it in a slightly different way. V minus theta n is equal to uh, one half the sum n equals one to n of sine of two times v minus theta n. Okay, so let me explain to you what I did. I rewrote this so that on the left hand side I would have yn times sine, that's this. On the right hand side I will have the sum of cosine times sine. Okay? And I use the half angle formula to write this in this different way. Okay? Cosine times sine is one half sine of two times the argument. Okay. So now I need to make some approximations because what I want to do is to solve for this phi, and it's, uh, it's kind of a mess, right? It's, it's inside the sine, and it's in, it's the sine is inside the sum. The same thing over here, equals 1 to n. OK, now let's say, let's assume that the angles at which I measure this inner product um, are integer multiples of uh, 
uh, are rational multiples of pi. Okay, so pi, you know, pi over two, pi over three, and so on. Okay, if we do that, then um, because this integral. Because this integral is equal to zero, well, you see that the right-hand side is basically like this integral if these thetas are measured this way. So what happens is with this assumption, this right-hand side uh, is approximately zero. Okay. This is the approximation I'm going to make in order to facilitate the estimation. <coughs> so then. I'll have the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side looks like sum uh, yn times sine of b minus theta n, so this is about equal to zero, and equals one to n, okay? And then I can expand this again using the, uh, the sine uh, uh, difference formula, and I get summation yn cosine phi, sine theta n minus sum y n, sine phi, cosine theta n equal to zero. Um, and then now what you can do is you can in fact solve for phi by uh, essentially solving, looking at the tangent of the angle. Okay? So once you simplify, what you have is the maximum likelihood estimate is approximately the arc tangent of sum y n sine theta n by sum y n cosine theta n. Okay. So we had to make an approximation, but in the end, the uh, the estimator, in fact. Again, it's, uh, it looks somewhat intuitive if we go back here. Let's see. Yeah, so look at what, we, what we're measuring. We're measuring the inner product between these two vectors. And what you're doing here is you're basically taking your measurements and you're correlating the measurements with the sine, you're correlating the measurements with the cosine, and then you're dividing. When you divide these two, you get something that's basically like the tangent of the angle you're looking for. And then you take the arc tangent of it and you get the estimate. Okay? If we didn't make that simplification, uh, if we didn't make the approximation, if we didn't make this approximation, then we would be stopping here and we would have to use some numerical technique to solve this problem. This would be an equation that would have to be solved using uh, some, something like Newton's method. Okay? Now I'll show you how to do that as well. Okay, one more property of uh, the maximum likelihood estimator, which is extremely useful, is, is the so-called invariance property. Okay, so suppose I have an estimate theta hat ml, which I worked very hard to, uh, to get. Now, uh, somebody comes along and says, you know what, I didn't really want theta, what I want is this. Okay, I want the maximum likelihood estimate of alpha, which is some weird function of theta. Okay? Now it turns out that if f is uh, 1 to 1, I'll clarify what that means, then uh, alpha hat maximum likelihood is in fact just a plug-in estimator. Okay? What's a one-to-one uh, -one function. One-to-one -one function is a function where there's a single value of theta corresponding to a single value of alpha, and that's it. So for example, alpha equals theta squared is not a one-to-one -one function. Okay. Now what happens if there is multiple values that give you the same value of alpha? That, it turns out, is not terribly difficult to deal with either. Um, so as an example, uh, you know, alpha equals theta squared because this is plus or minus theta squared. This is not one to one. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, 
uh, so if f is not one to one, then we define uh, uh, what's called a modified likelihood function. So define this PDF of x given uh, alpha. Uh, this will be the max of this PDF of x given theta for all values of theta belonging to a set S, where the set S is a set of all values that give you, set of all values of theta that give you the same alpha. So S is the set of all theta such that alpha is equal to f of theta. Okay, and then with this definition, then alpha hat is the argument that maximizes over alpha uh, this so-called, uh, make it a little different, p bar x given alpha. Okay, so let me describe what this math all means. Th they, the simple way to think about it is that if there are multiple values of theta that give you the same alpha, you basically need to try to see which one of them is the right one. Okay? So if you're going to plug in something, in order to decide what to plug in and which estimate to use, you basically have to redefine this function. This likelihood function is not simply p of x given theta, but it's, it's p of x given theta maximized over all values of theta that give you the same alpha. Okay? And then from that, you can come up with an estimator for, uh, for the alpha by maximizing this guy. So there's two sets. There's two steps of maximizing. One is to maximize this over all values of theta. Then you go to this function and you maximize over all the values of alpha. Okay. Okay. So let me give you a quick example of um, when uh, this invariance property is useful. So as an example, let's say your signal is just noise, zero mean, but with a, an unknown uh, variance. And what you're interested in is not the variance itself, but you're, estimated, you're interested in estimating the maximum likelihood uh, estimate of the noise power. And the noise power is uh, 10 log 10 sigma squared, and this is you know, measured in dB, right? So how would you do this? Well, um, if you remember, we did this uh, a little bit before. Um, this is over sigma squared, d sigma squared. You set this equal to zero. And what you get is um, sigma hat squared maximum likelihood. This is 1 over n summation of x squared n, OK? So this is the maximum likelihood of uh, the noise variance. And then this here is a one-to-one -one function. So all you have to do is p hat maximum likelihood. You just plug it in. 10 log 10 of sigma ml squared. OK? Okay, any questions? So this is the end of the maximum likelihood calculation, I mean, the maximum likelihood discussion. The next thing we're going to do after the midterm is for maximum likelihood, we did not assume that any value of theta was any more likely than any other value of theta. Right? In other words, when we, if I go back to the beginning of the lecture, and we started talking about this, yeah, if you remember this, this bit, we said, look, we're just going to compute these and then compare them to each other, right? And Andre mentioned, well, isn't this the same as uh, uh, this uh, uh, th this dissection 
criterion, where we just compared the probability density function. So that, that was a good observation. If you think of this in the context of even the detection, we did never, in this case, we never said anything about how likely theta 1 or theta 2 is. Right? We just don't know. And therefore, we computed the maximum likelihood estimate. Now, what would happen if, in addition to the data x, I also gave you some information about which values of theta are more likely than others? Okay, how would I do that? Well, I can give you a probability density function for theta. Right? I mean, the simplest case, let's take this. I could just say theta 1 happens a third of the time. Theta 2 happens two-thirds of the time. So I'm saying this guy is more likely than that guy. How would you now integrate that information into getting an estimator that not only uses the data, but also this prior information that I gave you? So that's a very simple example. More general version of it is uh, I give you a probability density function for theta, which is nothing but an indication of how likely each value of theta is to be true without ever having any data. Okay. When you do that, when you combine these two pieces of information together, namely the prior information and the data, what you get is something called a maximum a posteriori estimate, which is a generalization of this maximum likelihood estimate. And the name is, in fact, corresponding to what we did in the detection case. If you remember, when we had the probability of H1 and probability of H2, those two things then gave us the maximum a posteriori decision rule. The same thing happens here. You get the maximum a posteriori estimation. Okay? So we will do that later. Uh, please don't forget to turn in your homeworks. <coughs> I think you left your homework here, Andre, from last time. Yeah, what time would you like to come by? Uh, two. Two should be fine, yeah. Do you want me to name all your for that? No, no, it's fine. Uh, I know it's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. stuff that I've said does not make physical I mean, sense to you. Right now it does uh, right now this does make sense. So when I say it makes sense but when you're looking at the homework it doesn't make sense. No, uh, so, so sometimes when you say it I have to spend a considerable amount of effort to uh, uh, draw an analog to something I've already learned. Mm -hmm. And I can draw some kind of physical relation that way and right. I can understand it then. You should also uh, not expect that everything I say will have an analog to something you already know. I mean, some of the stuff here that we're discussing are things that you will never have experienced before. I mean, the whole idea of maximum likelihood mm -hmm. is something that requires a certain different level of thinking, which you know, an undergraduate student maybe just is not going to be taught anything that they could compare it to. So I'm just saying don't have the unreasonable expectation. No, ma maximum likelihood, uh, there's a physical analog to it. Mm -hmm. uh, where with Fisher information, I can't quite make that connection. Well, Fisher information, in fact, uh, actually has a very clear physical analog. And that, uh, ha have, you st have you studied uh, um, uh, statistical, uh, well, 
I mean, anything that you've studied in physics which has some statistical component, like entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, you've studied entropy, yeah. right? So entropy. Pardon me? Thermodynamics, yes. Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you look at statistical thermodynamics, mm -hmm. uh, Fisher information is basically a way of measuring entropy. Okay? So, um, okay. it's, a, it's a way of measuring uncertainty in the system. Mm -hmm. So, and where does the uncertainty come from? The uncertainty comes from the sensitivity of the, of the whole system to the value of the parameter. Right? So let's say you have a, a, a box filled with some gas, right? Mm -hmm. And the molecular weight of that gas is the parameter you're after, yeah. right? And now this gas is kind of bouncing around in this box, mm -hmm. right? Now you think of yourself, you think to yourself, how much does the entropy of the gas in this system depend on the molecular weight? Okay. If that molecular weight has nothing to do with the entropy of the gas in there, then you can't estimate it because, yeah. right? So that's what the Fisher information is. Fisher information is like, it, it's telling you how much things are going to, how, how much more chaotic things are going to get or how much things are going to change in your data depending on a small change in the value of the parameter. So the amount of disorder that you observe in your system is basically directly related to the amount of information that the system is giving you about the underlying parameter that you don't know. Okay? And if the parameter doesn't change anything about the system, if it doesn't change the amount of disorder in the system, then it's not measurable. That's what the information. That's what the Fisher information is telling you. Another way to think about it is, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, things that are physical to me may mean <laughs> not physical to you. So that's what I'm saying. It's a little bit difficult to always give you the perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also think of the Fisher information in a sort of geometric sense, mm -hmm. which is um, think of a think of an unknown parameter as a point in some high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. Okay, just this as a point in space. Basically, what the Fisher information measures is something like an ellipse around this point. Okay, or an ellipsoid around this point. It's like a, a it's like a cloud around this point. Okay. What the Fisher information measures is the size of this cloud. Okay? Mm -hmm. If the cloud is really concentrated in one point, right? Mm -hmm. Then the value of the parameter is basically fixed. Mm -hmm. right? There's no uncertainty around it. It's really easy to kind of grab that value because it doesn't change very much uh, if your data changes. On the other hand, if the cloud around it is much bigger, it's more fuzzy, then you're getting less information about the parameter from your data. So I'm going now in the opposite direction. The first description that I gave you was how much does the change in the parameter affect the entropy in your system. And what I'm saying now is how much does the change in the data, how much does a given data give you information about the parameter. And that's measured by the inverse of the Fisher information. Remember the Fisher information is a matrix in general, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that that matrix is basically, it defines uh, an ellipse, right? So if you take a matrix A, and you look at the set of all points that satisfy x transpose A, x equals 1, what's that equation? It's an ellipse, right? No, I have to work it out. Okay, well, if, if you have to work it out, then you're missing other intuition, okay? What's the equation? Uh, what, what does the, the, if I give you a, a, two by, a 2 by 1 vector, right? Mm -hmm. x transpose x equals 1. What shape does that define? Wait, x transpose x, x equals one. Uh, that's just. Well, that's basically the um, the dot. Okay, x transpose x. That's just the dot product of x. Mm -hmm. So that's a normalized. Uh, so that's a unit vector. No, it's not a unit vector. Um, why? I'm, I, I'm I'm asking you what is the shape that you get. If I ask you to plot x transpose x equals 1, where x is just a two-variable 
All right. Uh, what shape would you get? No, that would be just a unit circle. It's a unit circle, right? Yeah. So if instead of x transpose x, I give you x transpose a x, where a is not an identity matrix, mm -hmm. all that happens is you get an ellipse. Depending on what a is, you get an ellipse. Okay. And that a will simply determine whether that ellipse is really elongated or if it's more like a circle and which direction it's kind of pointing at and so on. Okay. So what happens is you think of that matrix, A, as being related to the Fisher information matrix. Okay? And so it's the Fisher information matrix is the inverse of the covariance matrix. That's this cloud that I was talking to you about. So the uncertainty around the parameter is the, the least uncertainty you can have around the parameter is given by the, the smallest ellipse that you can put around that center true value. And the shape of that ellipse is determined by, in fact, the inverse of the Fisher information. Uh, is there a way? OK. How can I think of this in terms of, say, orthogonal bases? Why do you need to think of it in terms of orthogonal bases? Uh, I mean, in this case, it makes sense to me. Um, say, back to some of the first few lectures, uh, when we were doing decision theory, uh, that, okay, to me, that part makes much more sense when I think of it as um, uh, vectors and vector projections. Yeah, sure, you can think of it that way. It becomes a little bit more complicated when you think about it uh, for arbitrary densities, though. So the, the vector projections are very easy to see when you have Gaussian noise and so on and so forth. So the, you know, the decisions tend to be things like x transpose y, and that's a you know, you know, linear decision uh, because the data happens to be Gaussian. <coughs> In general, the decision uh, rule will not be something simple like a linear or a quadratic. So if you want to think about it in terms of vector projections, that only takes your intuition so far. You know, I mean, a vector, a vector can be, well, an RM, so you can have, a, a, you, you can treat a signal of 100 points as a 100 dimensional vector. No, I understand. Uh, my, my point is you cannot always think of a decision rule as a vector projection. It doesn't always work. Okay. okay. So what I'm saying is you have an intuition which is valid for some subclass of problems. And it may be a little dangerous to try to push it too far because it doesn't always work that way. The reason why you're comfortable with it uh, is, well, I don't know what the reason is, but I'm just saying the fact that you're comfortable with it has to be tempered by the knowledge that it's only valid. These kinds of projection ideas are only valid when your data mm -hmm. is behaving in a very simple way. In other words, you have Gaussian noise model. Okay. Gaussian noise models will give you either a linear uh, or a quadratic detector. And those are easy to think about in terms of vector projections and so on. But when you go to more complicated noise models, these things fall apart. So you, you can't rely on the, the intuition as much as you did before. Well, what I'm having a little trouble understanding is, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to understand how I can help you. Um, you seem to make connections. You, you were asking me for physical intuition. Yeah. But what you're doing is you're making connections to abstract things, which are not physical necessarily, right? So I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. Because I can be as abstract as you want in terms of describing the mathematics to you, but that's not going to give you any physical intuition. I mean, you're talking about how can I think of these estimation problems in terms of uh, you know, orthogonal bases. I mean, that, that's really a huge leap of faith. You know, I could write all of this stuff in a Hilbert space, and then I can tell you projections in a Hilbert space will give you the estimator. But that's not going to give you any physical intuition whatsoever. In fact, it's going to do completely the opposite yeah. of what you're asking me. So, right. so what I suggest is you think about exactly what it is that you want okay. out of me, and I will be happy to help you with it. Okay. Okay? Uh, two hours.